Um, my wife and I share a mobile phone plan, <clears throat> and we're limited to, limited to two gigabytes of data between us. Now, some months, the, the, the data runs out, which is really annoying, but it resets on the 14th of each month. Now, this happened in February this year. Our mobile, mobile data ran out, and we were without mobile data for a few days. And on the morning of the 14th of February, I was relieved as our data was reset and I could access the data again. Now, I'm sure you've appreciated the, the happiness and the joy that you get where now you can get instant Facebook updates and that you don't have to wait 20 minutes until you get back to the office to collect that email. You can get data instantly. So I sent an innocuous text message to my wife expressing my relief at having mobile data back. And I also opportunistically, opportunistically took the advantage of taking uh, of, of the day to share my feelings. So the text message read, Sarah, mobile data is back. Hope you're going well today. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you. Now, there's only one slight problem with that text message. My wife's name is not Sarah. <laughs> Her name is Diane. So I had really and actually typed, ah, mobile data is back. And, but the very helpful autocorrect function on my phone had thoughtfully and providentially changed that to read, Sarah, mobile data is back. Hope you're going well. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you. And I sent that message to my wife. My wife's response was quite quick. <laughs> and she said, Sarah? I frantically typed, sorry, that meant to say, ah, not Sarah, that is very awkward. <laughs> and indeed, that was very awkward on many levels. Fortunately, my wife did see the funny side, and after I had demonstrated that I had no Sarahs in the contact list on my phone, we sat down to a slightly awkward Valentine's Day dinner that evening. Now, my unintentional gaffe demonstrates the power of words. When your wife is known by the word Diane, great power is unleashed by simply mistyping the words, Sarah, mobile data is back, I love you. Words have power. As Robin Williams' character John Keating in Dead Poets Society said, no matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world. Words do have power to change the world. Consider the power unleashed by the simple word, yes, no. I have a dream, or I want a divorce. Words can encourage, words can arouse suspicion, words can make you laugh, words can make the world different, words disrupt. So given the, the power of words, how do we speak disruptive words for good and for the, for the gospel? How do we use our words in a world not listening? Well, words are indeed central to the message of the Bible and the God we serve. Indeed, God himself demonstrates the power of words by creating the world by a word. And the power of words is seen in the passage before us now from, the, from 1 John. So if you've got to open in page 6 there, um, you can have a look and I'll be, I'll be referring to this a few times. Um, so look there in 1 John um, 1, 1, where John writes about the word, the word of life. He says that there in the third line. So what does he mean there by the word of life? Well, there's no doubt here that John is speaking about the historical man, Jesus Christ. The one which they have heard, the one which they have seen, looked at and touched. See, God didn't just speak words, he didn't inspire or write words, he came as the Word. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The historical figure of Jesus Christ, the Word of life. And notice the really disruptive thing about the Word of life there. It's in the first line, in verse 1. He said, that which was from the beginning... Now here there's allusions to, to creation uh, in the beginning, yet this word, this historical person, Jesus Christ, was there. 
He was there from the beginning. He was pre-existent and he really, really became flesh so that John could see and touch him. Now, this was disruptive to both contemporary Jewish and Greek cultures. In Jewish thought, God was eternal and transcendent. If you set your eyes on him, you would die. God was other, powerful, incomprehensible, and definitely not human-like. God and humanity were completely distinct. In fact, Joseph, sorry, Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria said that neither is God in human form, nor is the, body, the human body godlike. So hence the Orthodox Jews, uh, for a mere man, for mere flesh and blood to be pre-existent, to be from the beginning, which in Jewish categories could only be God himself, was scandalous. It's blasphemous. Only God was pre-existent and from the beginning. Yet this is what the Jewish author John writes. It must have been only the experience of encountering Jesus himself that a Jew could write such blasphemous scandal. A Jew wouldn't invent such a thing. He could only come to this conclusion by eyewitness testimony. Notice the, the threefold repetition of his tactile experience of the word of life. In verse 2 there, he says he's seen it and testified to it. In verse 3, we proclaim what we have seen and heard. John the Jew was determined to demonstrate that really, really, the word has become flesh and became and dwelt among us. That Jesus was the word. Now in making this statement, John intertwines the Jewish conception of God with the, Jewish, sorry, with the Greek concept of logos. Now the Greek word for word is logos. But in Greek thought, logos was a, a much wider ranging and more pervasive concept. It meant word, but it was also this rational principle which creates and orders the world. It was the power which uh, extended through thought, word, matter and nature, binding everything together. It was a bit like the force in Star Wars. Greeks saw the logos as an invisible power which surrounds and penetrates us and binds the galaxy together. Although they didn't use those words necessarily. So to the Greek... John is writing something like the force became flesh. We have seen, looked at and touched this rational principle which creates and binds the galaxy together. So both Jews and Greeks would not see God as the word, as something which we could see, hear or touch. For Jews, God was transcendent, inaccessible, indescribable. For Greeks, the word was rational, impersonal. It was not a word of life. So the incarnation is disruptive. And this concept is still disrupts the modern atheists and the modern people in our world who claim that there is no evidence to God or ask, why isn't God clearer? Why doesn't God speak to me? Well, he's spoken here. The answer's here. God hasn't stayed silent. The word of life appeared in space-time reality. God revealed himself and became one of us, and we have the testimony of those who could hear, touch, and see him. There is power, evidence, and disruption in the incarnation. God appeared to us. So the word appeared, disciples have seen it, but notice how this word is described. <clears throat> it's not a word of knowledge, it's not a word of insight, it's not a word of revelation or inspiration, even though all these are true. John describes it there in verse 1 as the word of life. The word has power by being life-giving. It's transformative. Now, we've already seen that the word is a person, but the word is also a message, a message that leads to deep change. And this change is seen in James chapter 1, which is this, uh, around the second passage there we've got there as well on your outlines in page 6. Now, in James chapter 1, a bit earlier in what was written there, in James 1, 18, James writes that new birth in Christ comes through the reception of the word of truth. So James 1, verse 18 says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So receiving the message of the word creates in us new birth in Christ. Then James says something really profound and somewhat mysterious here in James 1, 21. He says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This word is 
planted in us, the implanted word. So what does it mean to have a word implanted in us? It's more than simply receiving and accepting a new piece of knowledge or information. And it's not, it's not quite like getting a, a microchip of the Bible sort of uh, implanted in our arms. It means, in a sense, we actually get Jesus, the Word incarnate, the Word of life. Jesus becomes a part of us, implanted inside us, just like surgical implants. Now, I don't think this means that when you get x-rays, you're going to see little crosses or pictures of Jesus or something inside you. Um, not, Jesus is not implanted in that sort of sense. But it, what it does mean is that in some way, the Word is, becomes a part of us. The force became flesh and the force dwells in us. It's not that we just use the force. Jesus is not a, a power we can summon like a wizard. It's more profound and pervasive. He dwells within us. He becomes a part of who we are. It's implanted, embedded. Jesus says in John 14, 23, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. What a beautiful concept. The word of life. The word of truth. God implanted in us. Whilst beautiful, it's also incredibly disruptive. Whenever something implants in something else, it disrupts. Forms of orthopedic implants set off airport metal detectors. It disrupts the, the normal order. It also disrupts the security scanning personnel and the heart rate of fellow tra travellers. When a fertilised egg implants into a uterus, it's disruptive. A new life is formed and the mother gets pains and morning sickness. Now, having Jesus implanted in you is unlikely to make you sick, but accepting the word of life implanted in us will disrupt our core identity. It's an immense privilege to walk around carrying the implanted word in us. But so what? What difference does this implanted word make? We notice what James says there in verse 21. We get rid of filthiness, moral filth, and accept this implanted word, this disrupted identity. There's no place for immorality or filth when we have the implanted word in us. The same idea is found in 1 John 5, 8, sorry, 1 John 1, 5, 8, which is the, the verses after those verses here, where John explains that the heart of the Christian message is light and not darkness. Now, when John talks about light, he doesn't talk about uh, simply the light of illumination. He means the light of moral purity. We no longer serve darkness, moral filth, but light. We are changed, transformed. And those with the word in, implanted disrupts because we no longer belong to darkness, but we are the light of the world. It is a conference about disruption, after all, I suppose. <laughs> so... So what does this implantation mean for our words as we engage our workplaces and we live in this world? Well, I think there's several ways the New Testament offers for us with people with implanted light to use our words. But I want to focus on just a couple of different ways we can use our words to disrupt. Notice what John speaks there about in verses 2 and 3 of, jo of 1 John 1. The um, he says, um, uh, The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim it to you the eternal life which was with the Father and which was made manifest to us. And in verse 3, that which we have heard and seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. The word of life, what they have seen and touched, is a man, but this word is also a message, the eternal life that they proclaim. And this eternal life brings fellowship or a deep, intimate relationship with them and also fellowship with God the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we, like John, have the privilege of being able to proclaim this message. And we can proclaim it to fellow believers like we're doing tonight. But we're uniquely placed in our workplaces to proclaim this message of life to our colleagues so that they too may have fellowship with us and with the Father and the Son. And this is wonderful news, disruptive news, having fellowship, knowing and being known by the creator of the universe. Now, I'm not always sure that to proclaim this message means ramming the message down people's throats so that they, whenever you barely begin a spiritual conversation in the workplace. And I did hear of a, a passionate Christian evangelist once uh, in the workplace who um, inadvertently 
but literally made his colleagues run the other way when they saw, when they saw him the other end of the corridor because he was going to preach at them. Our culture rejects or despises being preached at or told the gospel. Uh, it's a major, major turn-off, and so we need to be thoughtful of how we proclaim this message to a world not listening. So I want to share a couple of ways in which we may be of a little better at proclaiming this message of good news in our workplaces. One of the ways is through the power, of, through the words of our own personal testimony. As John has done here in the Bible, he's spoken of his own personal encounter with Jesus, what he experienced, what he saw, what he heard and touched. And I think in our culture today, more than ever before, sharing the difference that an encounter with Jesus makes is a way to be heard. This is reinforced by recent McCrindle research which, uh, on faith and belief in Australia, which has discovered that one of the top attractors to faith, uh, to non-believers, are stories of people who have changed because of their faith. It's a real experience. And in our postmodern world, has to accept it as evidence for God. Because if it's made a difference to your life, people will listen. Sharing personally of how your faith has impacted you and the difference it makes in the day-to-day is a way of being heard, particularly if it's cost you something. An encounter with Jesus that disrupted a Jewish man such that he now calls a mere man that which was from the beginning. An encounter with Jesus today can disrupt our workplaces when we can demonstrate the, Jesus, the difference that Jesus has made for us. Now I find this reassuring and empowering because sometimes I'm concerned that I don't have the right words or the right formula to share with non-believers. But I can tell my story. I can tell the difference Jesus makes to me. And we all have our own story. And this is something that our world might just listen to. An atheist friend of mine who listens to the podcast and the radio show that I developed called uh, Bigger Questions, um, he says he really enjoys listening to it. And the thing that he finds most enjoyable, enjoyable about it is not the quiz, which I found quite disappointing because I think the quiz is quite hilarious. Um, but he says it's about listening to the stories of the guests, hearing the testimonies of the difference that Jesus has made in the lives of the guests that we have. This is for an atheist who finds that the most enjoyable part of a show. So maybe think about how you can articulate not just your story of coming to faith, but your story of the difference a personal encounter with Jesus makes to you. It doesn't have to be much. It can't be forced. It shouldn't be cringeworthy, unless you're a cringeworthy kind of person, um, maybe sometimes like I am. But what has the implanted word changed in your life? How has Jesus disrupted you, reordered your loves, changed your priorities, affected the way that you speak with people, or given you hope? Purpose, direction, security, peace, contentment, love, acceptance, happiness. I think articulating and demonstrating these will show that this is real and not just words. This is the true word, the implanted word. So let's proclaim the word of life, not just simply as a bunch of words in a tract, but as a life-giving encounter with that which was from the beginning. And as we proclaim this message in a world becoming more hostile to Christianity, I think we need to be reminded and reassured that this message really is good news. Jesus really is a word of life. Jesus really is the answer to the deepest longings and needs of our colleagues and for those around us here in Melbourne today. Because I think it is hard to proclaim the message in Melbourne here today, and it should be one of the hardest places in the world, I think, to proclaim the gospel because this is the most livable city in the world. This is as good as it gets. People are generally happy, healthy and hedonistic. They don't feel like they need God. But I think sometimes the confident exteriors of our colleagues are masks. Masks hiding restlessness, emptiness and loneliness. That though they are chasing after and they've caught some really good things, it'll be like ultimately chasing wind like sand running through the fingers. And this is because ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose, and ultimate life can only come from the one who is ultimate, the one who is eternal. To seek meaning and satisfactory, satisfaction in temporary and created things will just not work. Boris Becker, the famous tennis player, once said, I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as the youngest player. 
I was rich, I had all the material possessions I needed. It's this old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything, and yet they are so unhappy. I had no inner peace. Similarly, actress Sophia Loren said that she had everything but said that in my life there is an emptiness that is impossible to fulfill. Maybe this is how some of our colleagues feel. Successful, healthy, rich, but without peace and empty. And this emptiness is not impossible to fulfill. We have the eternal word of life. I've interviewed several people on bigger questions uh, who had it all but felt that something was missing. So uh, Tracy Trinto, a successful supermodel who partied with movie stars but felt empty on the inside. Another guy, Bill Medley, who's not the righteous brother Bill Medley, he was another Bill Medley. Um, he went to Hollywood to make his fortune. He almost did, but still found it empty and meaningless. But both found true and ultimate meaning, peace, satisfaction, and love in Jesus. True life, well beyond what a successful modeling career, a big house, a long holiday, and fulfilling job could ever give. Jesus can give this because he is eternal. He is ultimate. He is that which was from the beginning. Now, not everyone we work with will get this. Many are frantically trying to fill their lives with things to stop them thinking or pausing or reflecting on the meaninglessness under the sun, which means that we need to be patient. Thoughtfully prompt our colleagues to pause, stop, and think about some of the big questions of life. Where am I going? Is there meaning? Is there purpose? And we can gently share about how we have found meaning and purpose and eternal life with the one who was from the beginning. And as we proclaim, I think that our manner is also really important. So consider, I've got to share a couple of other verses from the New Testament. So for example, for example Ephesians 4.15, and said in, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Now these twin themes of speaking truth and love describes the philosophy and manner of our speech and should shape and characterize our speech as people in the light, speaking truth in love. But sometimes it's really hard to know how to speak truth in love, particularly when our colleagues passionately disagree with us. I think this is where I'm encouraged by Paul's uh, uh, in encouragement in Colossians 4, 4 verse 5, where he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Perhaps rather than trying to say something that is intended to be loving, but because of the subject it will be misinterpreted or misunderstood, it, it might just be wiser to say nothing at all. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and discerning if they hold their tongues. So in some cases, perhaps ironically, we'll be more effective in proclaiming the word of life by saying nothing. But we need wisdom to know when to speak and when to hold our tongues. And then Colossians 4 summarizes how our words should be as we proclaim. Let our conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So imagine our speech as a MasterChef dish. It's beautiful, it's wholesome and attractive, seasoned with salt, standing out from the crowd with people licking their lips, wanting more. That's what it means to proclaim and speak the message of the word of life with wisdom and love. Words are powerful. They can hurt. They can heal. They can and do disrupt. And depending on our workplace, words have varying degrees of importance. Journalists make their living writing words. Lawyers make their living on the interpretation of words. Comedians make their living by creatively twisting words. Salespeople make their living by pushing words. Engineers and those in IT make their living by avoiding words. Politicians get elected, sorry, politicians get elected by promising words. Politicians get re-elected by promising different words and explaining why the words that they first promised weren't really words that mattered. And doctors make their living by writing illegible words. But all of us have encountered the true and satisfying word of life. All of us have the implanted word inside of us. All of us have the privilege and of proclaiming the word with wisdom and love. 
So regardless of where we work, may we use our words to disrupt to the glory of the eternal word of life, which was from the beginning. Amen.